All right. Take your Bibles. Take your Bibles and let's go to uh, Numbers 14. Numbers chapter 14. Thank you, Amy. Well, it's good to get to preach again. I always enjoy Revival Week and hearing somebody else preach, but I miss getting to preach and uh, dive into the Word of God with you. But uh, so we're going to look at, and actually from our readings as we're going through the Bible this year, um, I'm, I'm going through it right with you, reading through it in the same, uh, with the same plan that you're using. Each week I'm praying, Lord, what would you want me to preach out of this week? What, what passage? This is one God put on my heart this week. And actually I'm going back into week eight readings for this, but I'm going to use a lot of scripture from weeks nine and 10 as well. And uh, Numbers 14, we're going to talk about, and I didn't put a title. I, I read this message off last night, and I thought, I didn't put a title on this message. Normally I do. So if you want to write something in there, you can put lessons from the life of Joshua and Caleb. That would be a good title, because that's what we're going to look at this morning. It's so interesting. Uh, Joshua and Caleb are so inspiring to me. Um, they refuse to go along with the crowd. They refused to just go along to get along, and in so many ways, they were radical. Uh, they were courageous, but not just for the sake of being radical. No, 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 no. They, they followed the Lord with everything they, they have, and they were antithetical to the rest of the world. So it, it made them dangerously different, and we get so much inspiration, but we get so much instruction from their story as well. Uh, I, I love just both of these guys and looking at the courage that they had. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And I want you to take this and I want you to apply this to your own life. And I want you to think about the culture that you find yourself in and, and how God would have you live, how God would have you conduct yourselves in the world around you. Numbers chapter 14, let's stand as we honor God in the reading of his word. And they have been sent in as part of the crew of, of spies into the land of the Canaanites. And uh, if, you, if you study through all of this, you'll see the Rephaim were there, the Anakim were there. Uh, these were people that were giants. We think about the giants of the Bible. We think about Goliath. Uh, but the two of the kings that they dispossessed before they went over into the land of Canaan, they were part of the Rephaim. Uh, and I looked up, you know, sometimes the Bible uses the word cubit, uh, as, a, as measurement, and one of the, the kings that they dispossessed in the land, uh, his, his bed was about eight feet wide and about 13 foot long. There, there are things upon this earth that we have not seen in our lifetime. And so when the spies went in to spy out the land and they said, they said, there are giants in the land, they weren't kidding. And there was a reason that they were afraid, and that's what makes the life of Joshua and Caleb so incredible that they went into that land and they said, the Lord will give it to us and the confidence that they have. So look in verse six of chapter 14 and Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes and they said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will Bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, because that's what they were doing. They said, we can't take this land. Ten of them disobeyed and said no. Ten of them were afraid. Ten of them led the people the wrong direction. That shows the majority doesn't always know what's best. It's something we have to deal with from Scripture. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not Fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Notice what the congregation then, their response in verse 10. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Father, help us as we study this word. As we look at the lives of these two men, how incredible their lives were, and, and what it says to us, the instruction, the inspiration given to us. Lord, I pray that you will take this word and the other scriptures that we look at this morning, and that you will not only inspire us, but Lord, you'll empower us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, and I pray you'll be moving across this 
room this morning in people's lives. And Lord God, every individual here, as you speak to each individual, I pray that our heart would be to say yes and to be obedient to you. Lord, when, when we do that, I believe that you will change us corporately and that you will continue revival in our midst. So thank you for that, Jesus. And I put it all in your hands. It's in your name we pray it all. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So I want to share three things with you this morning from the lives of these two men. And the first one is this, that we need to, like them, dare to be countercultural. You know, I was thinking about, you know, back in the 1960s, uh, whenever kind of the hippie movement was happening, you know, it was, it was kind of a radical thing to be countercultural, you know, to, to kind of rail against the morals of the day and, uh, and to go against that. And you have the sexual revolution come out of all of that. And, you know, so, so, so much, it was just not good. You have the Jesus movement come out of that as well. And, and there's a whole history behind that. But to be countercultural today means something different than what it meant back in the 60s and early 1970s. To be countercultural today means that we stand upon the morals of the scripture, that we go along with God and we don't go along with the world, that we listen to him and that we are different, that we are a peculiar and strange people to the world, but that we're led by the Lord God. That's what it means to be countercultural today. If you go by the word of God today, listen, you're going against the cultural tide. And we look at the life of Joshua and Caleb, and there were 10 in that group that said, no, no, we cannot, we can't go in and face those giants. Now, you, if you remember the story, they brought back just some grape clusters from that land and said they, they took poles and put it between them to carry the clusters of grapes. There, there was such a magnificence about the land in that day, and there were giants in the land. We can't, we can't take that. Ten of the twelve. And so all of Israel listened to that. The only problem is, is that even though it, it didn't look like a logical thing to go in and take that land, God had said, you do it, and I'll drive the people out. The God who parted the Red Sea, said, you go in and you take that land. And they didn't have enough faith. The, the God who brought all of the plagues upon Egypt, he said, you go in and you take that land. And they didn't have enough faith. And what it boiled down to, it was disobedience. It was rebellion. And man, to the point here where they wanted to stone these two men. And so we see these two men being countercultural. They, they tore their clothes. Man, that shows grief there in verse 6. That shows their disagreement that they were going to stand. They, the, everybody around them wanted to kill them because of it. Man, do we live in similar circumstances? I'd say yes. Man, we look at our culture today, and it is just off the rails. We live in a pagan culture steeped in worship of the earth and worship of nature and worship of just getting ahead, worship of everything else except the Lord God. In Deuteronomy 4.19, God warns them. This was in your readings this week. God warns them. He says, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. He said, you'll, you'll look up and you'll, you'll serve them and you'll make pagan idols. Listen, I've been preaching for a long time. And for years I've said, our, our, our idols are different, right? That in America, our idols are commerce. In America, maybe our, our idols are our 401k plans. Or maybe our idols are the possessions that we have, our homes, our cars, our boats, and things like that. Not evil in and of themselves, but, but things that will get so, so fixated upon those things. Those are our idols, and they look different. But you know what I've been noticing in our culture lately? You think back, and you think back to the golden calf that Aaron made when he took all of their jewelry and all of their gold, and Moses came down off that mountain, and he said, listen, they just gave me all this gold. I put it in the fire, and poof, out comes this calf. That's like the reasoning of a fourth grader. And, and, and a golden calf, we don't do that. We're much too sophisticated for that. Can, can I tell you something? My preaching's going to have to change just a little bit because our idols aren't really all that sophisticated anymore. You know what? I, I gave Jim some pictures. Jim, start to throw some pictures up here for me right quick. You know what that is? That's in the good state of Louisiana down in New Orleans. That, that is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but I, I think it's called the Mamie Wada statue. Uh, that's the figure of a woman. Go back to the first one. Yeah. 
Just stay with that one for just a moment. Um, that is out of, that went right where Lee Circle was. They took down a statue of, of Robert E. Lee and they put that. And that is out of African paganism, a, a water deity. And it's, got, it's the figure of a woman with a snake wrapped around and it is, and is deep in voodoo culture in Louisiana. That's not a lot different than a golden calf. Increasingly, what we're seeing is we're seeing paganism in the statues and idols just like it was back in biblical times where we think we're much too sophisticated to go down. Lest you think this is an isolated incident, go to the next ones. You've already seen the picture. This is up, this next one is a statue to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it is on the state courthouse in New York. And it is an idol and a statue to celebrate abortion. So that's what that one's about. Go to the next one. It's not always statues. There's the trans flag. Not just the LGBTQ flag, but the, the trans flag. That's painted on the streets of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You, you see what I'm saying? Increasingly, it's not that preachers can say, well, you need to pay attention. Your idols can be very deceptive, but they're kind of sophisticated and they're, they're, they're made for our day. So, you know, don't worship your 401k plan. Don't worship getting ahead. Don't worship commerce and all of those things. No, we're just going full-blown paganism in our culture. And it's looking a whole lot like Corinth there in the New Testament where there was a God and goddess for everything and a temple for everything. Athens, Mars Hill, when Paul looked around and he said, you got gods and statues to everything. You even got one of the unknown God to make sure that you cover your bases in case you miss one. We're becoming increasingly like that. Man, be countercultural. You can take those down, Jim. Thank you. Be countercultural. God said, don't you look to heaven and make gods of your, of your own design. And so Joshua and Caleb here, they tore their clothes and they showed the grief and sadness. They were not in line with the majority of their brethren. And see, our, our world today, we don't need to be in line with them because we're getting increasingly pagan. Our culture devalues life. We can see that all around and, and we can see that not just in abortion, but we can see it in so many other ways. When, when you look around and you see the murder and you see what's happening in our inner cities, our culture devalues life. Our culture is sexually perverse. Our culture is totally focused on self-gratification and greed, which is really worship of self. Our, our, our church culture in the midst of it is weak. And, and we need to stand and we need to be those countercultural Christians who've not compromised and run with the rest of the world. You know, as we were going through this week, sometimes verses just kind of jump off the page. Here's one from our readings this week, Deuteronomy 13, 17. And God had marked out when they had gone across the Jordan and they were going to dispossess those people, he had marked out some areas that were so evil, that were so sick, that were so perverse. He said, you have to stamp these people out. We don't like that. It doesn't hit well with our sensibilities, but this is the word of God. This is what he said to do. We don't argue with God. So he said, he said, you bring everything in the middle of that town together. He said, you go through and you, you, you kill the folks in that town. That's what he said. And he said, then you gather everything up, and he said, you burn it. And in Deuteronomy 13, 17, here's what he says about the things that they gathered up. He says, none of the devoted things shall stick to your hand. What's the devoted things? The devoted things are things he told them you burn, you get rid of. He says, none of the devoted things shall stick to your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you as he swore to your fathers. He said, don't you get sticky with the culture. Don't you let those things stick to your hand. He said, you leave them be. You leave them lie. You let them stay where they are, and you destroyed that. Don't take the things of their pagan culture, and, let, and your hands get sticky. And, and, and we look at how Moses recounted God's own words concerning the magnificent example of Caleb and Joshua because they didn't have sticky hands. They decided that they were going to run against the culture, against the evil within their culture. And in Numbers chapter 32, here's what God says through Moses. Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt, 
from 20 years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for why? For they have wholly followed the Lord. Can I tell you, can I encourage you, can I challenge you? Be countercultural. Don't be like the rest of the world. And, 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 and kids, I'm speaking a word to you. You start early and you be countercultural. Don't be like the rest of the world because you, you, will, you will run into kids that they just want you to follow right along in their steps. Don't do it. Don't you do it. And adults, the same word to you. It, it, we have to take a stand on some things a biblical stand on some things because we have sat silent for far too long and just moved right along with the culture. And that's where our culture is going, increasingly pagan, increasingly perverse. If we learn anything from Joshua and Caleb, it is to be countercultural. But then we learn this as well. Look back in your, in your text in verse 9. Here's what they said, only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land. They have bread for us. Their protection's removed from them. The Lord's with us. He says it twice. Do not fear them. You know what we need to do? We need to embrace a little bravery. Man, I'm telling you, in England, they just, they just reversed a decision by the courts that took a street preacher, and because he simply read the Scripture regarding sexual morality and God's intention for it, and he spoke against homosexuality. They sent out the terrorism task force to get that guy. And they landed him in jail. And, and a court just reversed the decision, praise the Lord. But, they, but even as they reversed it, the Supreme Justice on that particular court said, I really think the government was right in what they did. But the law just doesn't back them up. He sympathized with the government. That's, it. That's the way we're moving. That's the way we're going. It, it, it is encroaching in, increasingly into our world. You can be put in jail in Canada for hate speech just from reading the things of Scripture. All across the world, this is what we see. And, and, and so we're going to have to have some bravery. because Some of us are going to end up in jail. And you, and you think I'm kidding. Listen, it is encroached into Canada. It is encroaching into South America. And there are people being jailed for just speaking what is true from the Word of God, and it's called hate speech. We're going to have to embrace a little bravery. And twice here, at the risk of being killed, they say, don't, don't fear. Do not rebel and do not fear. The Holy Spirit will give us courage. I want you to take your Bibles for just a moment. Mark your place in Numbers 14, and I want you to go over to Joshua 14 for just a second. Now, 40 years pass, and God tells them, he says, everybody that's over 20 is going to perish in this wilderness. And that is exactly what happened. So when everybody perished and he was ready to take the next generation over into the promised land, I want you just to look. Just, just hang on with me here and let's look into Scripture and let's see Caleb. I'm telling you, Caleb was the man. And it says in Joshua 14, these are the inheritances that the people received in the land of Canaan which Eleazar, the priest of Joshua, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one-half tribes. Two and a half tribes stayed on the other side of the Jordan. For Moses had given the inheritance to two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. And let's, let's go on down. Verse 6. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to them, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt Yet I wholly followed the Lord, God, the Lord my God. Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which 
Your feet is trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. And I and listen to the miracle of this. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. What a man. See, he embraced some bravery. Do not fear them. Do not fear them. Do not rebel against the Lord. And the Lord miraculously took that man and he took him from 40 years of age to 85 years of age and he lost no strength. That's a miracle. Because I'm telling you, I'm standing here today at 57 and I don't have the strength I had when I was 40. And it's, I, I hear it's going to get worse. We need to embrace a little bravery because God can take care of us, and he will in this culture. And it may be that he takes care of us and is with us in the fire as we go to jail and as we face persecution. Listen, Deuteronomy 7 says this, If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you, you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. And there's no doubt we get fearful, but we got to continually rely on his power and confess this, as Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. What do we learn? The first two lessons from Joshua and Caleb, be countercultural. Go against the cultural tide because it's pagan, it's perverse today. And embrace a little bit of bravery. God will honor it. The third thing that we learn is this, really trust in the Lord. Man, we see them trusting, trusting, trusting. Back in that passage in, in, in chapter 14 of Numbers, look in verse 8. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Do you hear the trust? If the Lord delights in us. He was just trusting the Lord. Whatever may come, he was going to trust the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. How in the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that... They may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth, and they may teach their children so, to trust the Lord, to fear the Lord, to honor him, to obey him, to trust him. This was the message, and, and we are to lean into the Lord and learn to trust him. Psalm 40 and verse 4 says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Embrace a little bravery and learn to really, really, really trust the Lord. That's the most difficult thing, I think, for born-again believers to do is to really trust the Lord because we want to figure it out ourselves. And when emergencies and calamities come our way, we're figuring out an escape plan. And, and we need to learn to walk with him. And to really learn to trust him. How do we do that? We stay on our knees in prayer and we stay in this word and, and here's something else. We stay under the umbrella, protective umbrella of the people of God, the local church. There is protection here that is supernatural. We stand together and God protects. He protects his bride. And one of Satan's favorite things to do is one of his very favorite things to do is to get you out of the local church. Because it's like taking a coal that is live and burning out of a group of coals and with a set of tongs, you can take one coal out and you set it over here by itself and what happens? It goes out. 
it gets cold. It loses that fire. And that's what Satan likes to do. There is something, and, and, I could, and I could preach a whole other message. I could take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I could preach a whole other message on what happens and what Satan does to a person when they're taken out from under the protective covering of the local church. The local church is important. And, and don't get out from under that protection of the local church. It is vital. We trust him. We stay on our knees. We stay in the word we stay involved in the body of Christ. And if you'll do that, oh, listen, he will protect you even in the midst of the fire. So what do we learn here? We learn this from their lives. Become properly countercultural. Become brave souls. Become trust in the Lord type Christians. The Lord's with us. That's what he says in verse 9. Remember the chorus of the old hymn we used to sing? Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Can I tell you when he saves you and, and you're regenerated, you're born again? Listen, he saved you completely. That's your justified. He continues to save you as he sets you apart for his purposes. That's being sanctified. He will save you one day when he delivers you from this body of death and sin and he, he ushers you into his presence and one day you get a glorified body and that's being glorified. God has wrapped up every part, every portion of our salvation and therefore we can be like Joshua and Caleb. We don't have to fear. They can put those nasty pagan statues all over the place. And we'll continue to serve the Lord our God. They can throw us in jail, and we will continue to serve the Lord our God. The rest of the culture can say we're insane, and we will continue to serve the Lord our God. And I'm telling you, we need to go against the cultural tide. I watched James White and Jeff Durbin, two pastors of more of the reform movement, debate a young man, I, I'm blank on his name, it's Brandon something or other, who, who stands before huge crowds as a homosexual and says God endorses homosexuality and has a church full of people and speaks to huge crowds and says God endorses homosexuality because this may contain some of the Word of God, but it's really not the Word of God. And we are progressive enough we are progressive enough today to know what things to throw out and what things to accept. And, and really, we're changing, we're evolving, and we know now that, that in Jesus' love, he's, he, not only does he think it's okay, man, he endorses homosexual Christians. That was his statement. That was his statement. And I watched the debate from that, and I thought, man, evil is coming at us from every turn. And, and we have to stay together and we have to be a people that stay in the Word because it's going to get rocky. It's going to get dicey. And there's going to be some things that's going to be very troubling to us. And I think, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Things are going to wax evil before the Lord returns. More so, I think, than what we can even imagine. What are you going to do? Let me challenge you this morning, be a Joshua, be a Caleb within your culture. Bow your heads with me this morning. If you're here and what I've said has resonated with you, but you say, I don't have that power, I don't have that authority in my life, and I just kind of feel lost and hopeless. Oh, can I tell you, if you have never trusted Christ to save you, that's the place where you need to begin. That's... That's what you need to respond to this morning. If you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, today's the day. Would you ask him to save your soul? Right now in the quietness of this place, you don't have to, don't just repeat these words, but let me help you. If you're ready to know Christ, you know you're a sinner and lost in your sin and there's a void in your life that nothing is filled, can I tell you that is a God-shaped void? And he wants to fill it today, and only he can fill it. He'll save your soul. He'll forgive your sins. Right now, if that's your heart and you want to know him as Savior, 
and he died for your sins. If you want to know him as your Savior, right now would you tell him, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I turn from going my own way and trust in myself. And I turn to you, Lord Jesus. Would you save my soul and be the Lord of my life? In Jesus' name. If you prayed that this morning, I want you to come and tell me here in just a moment as we stand and have the invitation time. Say, I prayed that prayer this morning. What do I do now? Let me encourage you with that. If you're here and you've got another decision to make, if you need prayer, come on. If you need to join with this church, we invite you. Whatever it is that God has put on your heart, if you need to surrender to ministry or missions, let it be known. Come on. Every individual here, if God puts something on your heart, say yes to him. That's the appropriate response. Do not fear. Do not rebel. Say yes. Jesus, this is your time, your invitation. Whatever you want to do in this place, I pray that you would do. And I pray that every single person here would submit and say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand. This morning, if you didn't understand what it means to be saved, you got more questions. You